Welcome, and thank you for joining us today for our webinar on the impact of menopause on women at work, a guide conversation. I'm Dr. Irina Nigne, Chief Science Officer for the Society for Women's Health Research. SWHR is a national nonprofit dedicated to advancing women's health through science, policy, and education while promoting research on sex differences to optimize women's health. For those of you who are active on social media, SWHR will be live tweeting during this event and invite you to use the hashtag SWHRTalksMenopause on all social media. An estimated 6,000 women in the United States reach menopause daily, with 51 being the average age. For many individuals, the hormonal changes that take place during the menopause transition are associated with symptoms from hot flashes and vaginal dryness to insomnia and sleep disturbances, brain fog, and fluctuations in mood. These highly variable symptoms are often not recognized to mark the menopause transition, resulting in delays in seeking treatment and potential disruptions of day-to-day -day activities for millions of women. Menopause is a life stage that all women of a certain age will experience, and approximately 44% of women in the workforce being older than 45, menopause symptoms have been reported to affect up to 20% of the U.S. workforce. Increases in retirement age and life expectancy are putting a demand on workplace settings to recognize the far-reaching economic, social, and healthcare impacts of menopause on women's health and society at large. So SWHR convened an interdisciplinary working group of researchers, healthcare providers, patient advocates, and human resource professionals with expertise in menopause, workplace wellness, and employment policies to develop a nationwide survey and resources informed by data from this ongoing study. The employee perspectives and challenges concerning transition of menopause, or better known as the impact menopause study, aims to better understand the workplace experiences of individuals who have entered or completed the menopause transition, as well as gain insights from their coworkers and employers on the impact of menopause in the workplace. Earlier this year, we released a bulletin that provided some key outtakes from the survey study, uh, from the study survey concerning the impacts of menopause in the workplace. And a few weeks ago, we just launched a set of resource guides to help address challenges that were highlighted in the study data. A guide for women was created to support women in the workplace as they go through the menopause transition. It includes tips for working while living through your menopause transition, examples of menopause-friendly accommodations and adjustments to help maintain productivity and job satisfaction during this transformative life stage. A guide was also created to support managers, employers, and human resource professionals in understanding the menopause transition and fostering menopause-friendly workplaces for all of their employees. A lot of these recommendations can apply broadly. So both guides include suggestions for accommodations, conversation tips, an awareness poster that can be put in a break room, and resources and support organizations for menopause in general and menopause in the workplace. SWHR is proud to host this webinar to discuss the challenges that women experiencing menopause symptoms face in the workplace and explore strategies that employers and supervisors can implement to improve workplace environments for midlife and postmenopausal women. We have three members from our Menopause Workplace Education Working Group with us today that are going to walk us through outtakes from the Impact Menopause Study and share their own personal expertise as we engage in this important discussion. Claire Gill, the Chief Executive Officer of the Bone Health and Osteoporosis Foundation and founder of the National Menopause Foundation. We have Dr. Mesh Seibel, editor of the Hot Years magazine and co-author of the book, Working Through Menopause, The Impact on Women, Business, and the Bottom Line. And Dr. Alicia Grandy, liberal arts professor of psychology and affiliate faculty of labor and employment relations at Penn State University. I would also like to thank the sponsors of today's event, Estella's Pharma, Bayer, Nutrafol, and Pfizer. SWHR does maintain independence and editorial control over our program development, content, and work products. Following the speaker presentations, I'll be moderating the discussion with all of our panelists, so we invite you to use the Q&A box to submit questions throughout the event. We will try to address as many questions as we can during this program, especially submissions that cover recurring themes or questions with broader applicability to our audience. So at this time, 
I invite um, Claire Gill to turn on her camera and set up. And as she's um, setting up, she will be talking about the impacts of menopause on women's health and her inspiration for advocacy in this space. Thank you so much for joining us, Claire. Pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. It's really wonderful to be here with all of you and to talk about this really important study that uh, Society for Women's Health Research led us all on. And I'm gonna give you a little brief background on some of the impacts on the individual. And some of this will be refresher for many of you and some of it'll be new, I hope. So let's just talk a little bit about the menopausal journey and what that means. I think that it's really important that we acknowledge that it is a journey and that there are several stages to what I think we all consider menopause. But the menopausal journey and the transition begins with perimenopause. And it's a transition time when we can experience a natural decline in our reproductive hormones and changes to our menstrual cycles. And it's also when we start experiencing some menopausal symptoms, but oftentimes women don't even know that what they are experiencing is the beginning of that menopausal journey. Menopause is the moment in life that we have ceased our menstrual cycle for 12 consecutive months. That's menopause. Everything before is perimenopause and everything after, as we see in this flowchart, is post-menopause. So it's the life stage that happens after menopause is completed. What's really fascinating is that women spend up to a third of their lifetime now post-menopausal. And we can have about three decades of life post-menopause, given that our current average age expectancy, life expectancy for women is about 81. So if the average age for women to experience menopause, the, the 12 month cessation of our postmenopausal. So it's important that we understand and share this information so that women and their clinicians know that the journey can start between 30 and 35 years when we do reproductive, then we move into perimenopause, which is three to seven years. So if you're thinking about that, if the average age is 51 for the entering of menopause, then women are starting to experience menopausal symptoms in their mid forties. And then again, post-menopausal, there's a long lifespan. And as we'll talk about further, there's a lot of things we need to consider as we think about what happens to us on the journey and what happens to us as for we have uh, entered and completed menopause. So the types of menopause, um, are also very different and there's really no right or wrong. It compares, it, it's completely um, individual. And while we talk about averages all the time, there is really no normal. You, whatever's happening to you is normal. And that's what you need to know and be able to talk about with your clinician. We consider premature menopause for women who experience menopause before the age of 40. Early menopause are when you experience menopause, again, the cessation of the uh, menstrual cycle between 40 and 45. So the early, uh, the early half of that 40s decade. And then menopause, again, as I mentioned, at the typical age, average is 51, but anywhere above 46 is considered really amongst the, the normal range. Pathways for menopause also differ. We can have a natural ovarian aging and the estrogen decline, as we've talked about when we think about the transition happening, but women who experience chemotherapy or radiation are often impacted with their menopausal journey when they enter menopause and what types of symptoms they experience. Damage or surgical removal of the ovaries is another reason why women might enter menopause. Um, at something that's not the average age. And then there are genetic factors. Sometimes there's just the genetic makeup that a woman will enter menopause earlier or later. So again, there's no right or wrong. It's just important to track your own progress or your patient's progress and figure out what's right for them and what stage of the journey they're experiencing. We talked a little bit earlier about all the different types of symptoms that happen, and I'm just gonna cover some of the more common symptoms of menopause. Vassar motor symptoms 
uh, is the medical term we use for those hot flashes and night sweats. That's a very common experience for women during the menopausal transition. And it's also the one I think we as consumers know more about. We know that there are these waves of hot flashes and we know that people talk about, you know, the sleep, uh, waking up from sleep with um, sleep sweats. So that again is called vascular motor symptoms and it is one of the most common. Cognitive difficulties, brain fog, difficult, difficulty concentrating as I'm having right now. Um, that's something that again, many women don't understand or know is a normal part of the menopausal transition where you can't find the word you know, you know the word, but you just can't bring it to the forefront to say it. That's something that's very common. We hear all the time women talking about, wow, I just didn't, couldn't grasp the word. I didn't know what to say. Um, so that again, is something that we experience during the menopausal transition. Mood disturbances, depressive symptoms, increased anxiety. For many women who have not had these types of symptoms previously, it can be a big shock when you're reaching midlife and all of a sudden you're having some depressive episodes or you're anxious in a way that you've never been before. If we're not um, told that this is a common happening during the menopausal transition, that can be really disturbing. So again, it's really important that we talk about all of the symptoms of menopause to be able to provide some guidance on what you might experience. And keep in mind, you may not experience one or any of these, it just depends on your own personal journey. Insomnia and sleep disturbance becomes an issue during the menopausal transition. And then there's a lot of stuff happening with what are now called genital symptoms or geriurinary symptoms of menopause. Vaginal dryness, irritation, painful sex. Again, not things that are normally talked about. And women can feel isolated when they're experiencing it and don't know where to turn but it is completely normal. And it is something that we should talk to our healthcare providers about if it's causing us any kind of disruption or um, pain. And it's an abs absolute topic that should be discussed. Urinary symptoms can be urgency where you have to get to the bathroom and you can't hold it anymore. Um, painful urination, urination, recurring UTIs also occur during the menopausal transition. So again, it's important that we pay attention to what's happening in our bodies, keep track of those symptoms, their duration and their severity, and then bring those to our healthcare providers to have conversations so th those symptoms can be addressed. As we enter menopause and get to our postmenopausal years, there's also some conditions and diseases that become a greater risk for women after menopause. Osteoporosis is obviously one that I pay a lot of attention to um, as CEO of the Bone Health and Osteoporosis Foundation. And one of the things we often share is that women can lose up to 20% of their bone density in the first five to seven years post-menopause. And we often wonder why we think osteoporosis is a woman's disease. It's really only because we have that dramatic drop in estrogen, which impacts our bone density. Men get osteoporosis too. They just don't have that dramatic drop of their reproductive genes, or sorry, the reproductive hormones at midlife. So theirs happens a little bit later in life. Breast cancer risk also is increased postmenopausal, and heart disease risk is increased postmenopausal. So menopause is a great time for all of us to take stock of our current health and well being and make a plan with our medical providers on how we will address our risk factors because all of these have hereditary risk factors, have um, environmental risk factors and are impacted by our diet and exercise. So we really need to have a plan to prevent these risks. I wanna quickly just touch on um, a survey that we did with um, uh, women asking them about how much they knew about the menopausal journey before they entered it um, and I knew a little bit, you can see, was about up to 40% of the responses, but I knew very little about it, or I knew nothing about menopause, except that the period stops. That also took up another 40% of the responses. So we have a lot of work to do in educating women. And menopause in the workplace as a topic of this subject, it's also really important to know that when we examined this issue with Bank of America in our Breakthrough the Stigma study, 
one of the things that we realized were women were experiencing a lot of these symptoms and they did not feel comfortable talking about it in the workplace. And the reason that HR managers weren't addressing it is because employees weren't asking for it. So it's really not only incumbent upon us as women to ask for these things within the workplace and anything that we might need to better manage our symptoms, but it's really important for employers to initiate the conversation so the impetus is not always on the woman to address this menopausal stage. Thank you so much, uh, Claire. That was um, very, it was a wonderful introduction to get us deeper into um, Dr. Siebel in his discussion, if you want to turn on your camera now, he will be discussing the impacts of menopause on the workplace and how we can begin cultivating more menopause-friendly work environments. Yeah. Well, I thank you very much for the opportunity to participate in this program and also to the Society for Women's Health Research for actually putting this study together and, and helping to disseminate it. I wanna talk a little bit now about uh, you know, menopause in the workplace and some of the impact that it has. As we uh, spoke about earlier, half of the entire workforce are women. And roughly half, just under half of the women in the workforce are either entering menopause or they are in menopause. And when you think about the fact that menopause is not about age, it's about transition. And we know that up to 10% of women can be entering menopause they can be actually in menopause before they are 45 years of age. Up to 10% are in menopause before age 45. And when you add to that, that the symptoms of menopause actually begin as much as 10 years before menopause occurs, women in their late 30s, early 40s are commonly having symptoms for menopause. Perimenopause is a time when the symptoms are often most uh, increased. More than 75% of women work through their menopause transition and women are staying in the workplace longer. So there are more and more women in menopause in the workplace and being symptomatic. And women are employed in a diverse array of industries and they're more than half of essential workers. If you think about it, how many women are there disproportionately among teachers, among nurses, among the healthcare professionals? There are just so many that this is uh, creating a huge impact. As a matter of fact, um, in a study that came out in the uh, UK about two years ago, up to 40% of primary care physicians who were women dropped out of the workforce from the symptoms of menopause. And the biggest reason they gave is because they didn't feel comfortable talking with their uh, supervisors. Now, if you're a doctor and you can't feel comfortable talking with your supervisor about a, a, a normal transitional symptom, how does that leave the rest of women in the workplace? It has a huge impact on work. 38% of women are saying that menopause is impacting their presenteeism. And, and presenteeism is a loss in productivity when an employee is not fully functioning in the workplace because they aren't feeling well. And if you think about it, if you're having symptoms of brain fog, if you're feeling sleepy and tired, if you're feeling anxious or depressed, if you feel like you're having mood swings where you could snap at a time you wouldn't normally, it's only reasonable that you're going to have some impact on your work. A quarter of women are thinking about leaving the workforce due to menopause. That is huge. It's such a large number of people in the workforce because women, when they are at the time of menopause, most of them are at the peak of their professional careers. They're on the rise in terms of their the knowledge, wisdom. They have the institutional knowledge that's there. And so it's a huge consideration when a woman at this point in her career decides to leave work. It's an expensive issue. One study showed it $150 million of loss of 
productivity worldwide, but a Bloomberg study that came out a couple of years ago had the law, had the, you know, the cost even higher. And when you think about it, one study that came out uh, about uh, six years ago showed that just hot flashes alone that aren't treated in the workplace, just that one symptom compared to women whose hot flashes were treated, that cost businesses $14 billion across the United States. And it caused six more days of lost work because women were going to seek health care. And that creates absenteeism or a loss of productivity due to uh, a, an unplanned leave from work. So this has a huge impact on women in their careers. You have one in four women are not pursuing or did not pursue a leadership opportunity at the peaks of their career. One in three women considered reducing their workload. And two out of five, 40% considered finding or found a new job. And what's really distressing is one in 10 women actually dropped out of the workforce because of menopause. This leads to a vicious cycle of circumstances. This is from our book, Working Through Menopause, but you can see that menopause symptoms impacts a woman's performance, that can lead to embarrassment and lower self-esteem. Women are often feeling that menopause is taboo to talk about. They try to hide their symptoms because they don't want anyone else to know that they're having menopausal symptoms. They may call in sick. That leads to the absenteeism sometimes because they may be going to the doctor for menopause or just can't get their minds together because they're so tired from sleep loss. And that increases stress and stress increases menopause symptoms. So the whole thing builds on itself. So some of the summary points that I wanna talk about in closing is that menopause isn't about age. Many times we think about it as, oh, a person in menopause is old. Well, no, they're not necessarily old at all. As I said, up to 10% are old. In menopause before 45, one in a ovaries in their late 30s because they're trying to lower their risk of breast or ovarian cancer. So we have a, a huge variation in age. So it's about the transition. I want to comment on the role of estrogen. In, 19, in 1999 to 2001, estrogen was the number one prescribed medication in the United States. There was more than $7 billion of estrogen sold in the United States, the number one prescribed medication. But with the uh, publication of the Women's Health Initiative, the so-called WHI, that study incorrectly suggested that estrogen increased the risk of breast cancer, heart disease, and other things. That has been proven completely inaccurate. I have two books on that, the estrogen window and the estrogen fix. That is an inaccurate thing due to poor study design. But it cost a generation of women to be cautious about taking hormone replacement, and it cost a generation of doctors to be educated about it. It really created, in my mind, uh, in addition to a glass ceiling, which we all know exists for women, a silent ceiling, a silent ceiling of menopause where women are not talking about something that is impacting their capacity to function at their optimal best self. And that has a big impact on the workplace. All of that could be benefited by having menopause policies that would help businesses and the people who work in them, the employees, the female employees, to have a place to go safely, confidently, and with the certainty that they could get some help and insight, empathy, understanding, and support. So it makes sense. And as I talked about earlier, it's expensive to businesses, and it could make not only sense, but dollars. 
There's increasing legal ramifications about menopause that workplaces should be aware of. There's now case precedent in the legal arena for both age discrimination and gender discrimination, setting case precedent so that women would have rights if their menopause symptoms are not addressed in the workplace. And there is something that's very important going on in the UK, the number of uh, legal reactions to menopause, women say, hey, I'm not getting the help that I need, have tripled in uh, the last couple of years. And there has been a lot of siding with the women who need that kind of support. And we have to realize that in 1960 in the United States, there were no states required to give job protection for maternity leave. And it was not until February of 1993 that the Family and Medical Leave Act was uh, it put into place that gave up to 12 weeks of unpaid, but at least 12 weeks leave, and you needed to get your job back. That was just 1993. So we have to realize that we are now seeing those women 30 years later now in menopause, and they're going to be expected, then they should expect to get the support that they need. And I'm hoping there'll be legal protection for that. There are acts in Congress that are being considered now. And also take into consideration the men as well in menopause, because men, if the women are not getting the information they need, the men are totally clueless. And this creates a big set of conditions where men don't understand. There was a study in the UK where women went to the men in their offices and actually asked them to put on these heated vests and the men would be able to get the temperature like rising so that they would experience what it was like for a really bad hot flash. And suddenly there was a great deal more insight to what the women were experiencing. So that leads to this process uh, example I'll show you, which is that once we can get awareness, once awareness is created, then we can create advocacy for women in the workplace. And once we are advocating, then there can begin to be acceptance and understand that menopause is a normal transition and we can take the actions that are necessary to make policies for menopause, to give special considerations, to offer places where women can go and change clothes, just like women have places to do breastfeeding and so forth. There can be more sanitary kinds of supplies for women who are having heavy uh, bleeding. There can be some control over the space that the woman is in that allows her to um, have the capacity to adjust the temperature around her, more bathrooms and so forth. And all of that leads to transformation. And that's what I hope we can accomplish and that we are at the beginning of just the, the steps necessary to create transformation in the workplace. So I'll stop with that at this moment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Seibel. I would like to note that those who are turned in live can submit questions at any time using the Q&A question and answer function within the app. And we will try to address as many as we can during the panel discussion portion of the event. And last but not least, I'd like to invite Dr. Alicia Grandy to take us deeper into how we can transform our workplace culture to be more sensitive to multi-generational employee experiences, particularly midlife and older women. Thank you, Alicia. Sure. Hi. It's nice to be with you all today. And I think you're going to hear some common themes uh, from what the first two said, but hopefully with a different lens. Um, I'm coming from industrial organizational psychology. So I um, am interested in how we can uh, improve the workplace uh, in terms of reducing stress and improving productivity at the same time, rather than thinking of them as trade-offs. Um, and also I study diversity. And so this has become uh, studying menopause and the intersection it is for um, age and gender, as well as um, other implications such as for race, um, how they play a role in improving and affecting um, workplace stresses.
first, um, I recently situated um, menopause in a broader view of women's careers, and this has been alluded to by our prior two speakers. Um, the idea that you know women face a certain body. So now we can um, we can get the treatment that we need by disclosing it. But even more interestingly in this research, we find that when the person is seen as having a, a hot flash, if she then says, it's a hot flash, it's menopausal, I'm in that menopausal stage of life, very matter of factly, um, that disclosure actually appears, it overrides the stereotype of being seen as not very agentic. It's seen as agentic to take charge and to say, yeah, it's menopause. So what? <laughs> That's life. And then one is seen as more of a leader because they've demonstrated that agency and proactivity. So this was a very exciting finding. We found in some follow-up studies that if the woman was simply known as being menopausal, like seen as uh, the, the hot flashes were diagnosed as menopause, as opposed to other things such as anxiety or hot flashes, um, or excuse me, anxiety or allergies, if they were known to be menopausal, um, again, it was seen as less problematic than not being known for what they, they are. So the good news is that this is consistent with this idea that we've got to be talking about these things. Um, so thinking about how do we change the culture? What can we do to destigmatize it? Um, so we can increase our awareness. Um, and that's part of what this toolkit is allowing us to do. Um, we need to disseminate that as widely as possible. Everyone needs to know about this, not just women who are of a certain age. Um, we need to address these biases and stereotypes when we, we see them happening. So I was in a meeting where I made a joke, uh, room was getting hot. And I said, oh, I think I'm glad. I, I hope I'm not the only one. I feel like I'm having a hot flash. And the reaction by the leader of the group was, oh, I don't want to hear about that. And my response at that time was, okay, I was so surprised. And then now I think I would be all, why not? <laughs> you know, and just question and, and call out those biases when we see them happening in real life. Um, because so many people are experiencing it. In fact, if I were to call it out now, other women in the room would be like, oh, I got you. I know exactly what's happening, right? And then we can build community and support for it. And that's a way to advocate for support and inclusion, talking about it as a basic life transition. Um, we also need to think about how do we create comfortable and safe spaces. So we can do this environmentally. Um, the toolkit talks about um, a very simple accommodation. I have this $5 fan from a local store. It is a lifesaver. You know, the room temperature goes up one degree and my superpower is I can tell. My body knows before the air conditioning unit knows. But I can turn on this fan and it immediately re-regulates my temperature and I'm fine. Um, you think about clothing control. Uniforms that are polyester or don't breathe or are constricting are, are creating discomfort that doesn't have to be there. Um, think about remote and flexible work, you know, having the, the means to, to have time and space that allows us to, to adjust, um, whether it's hot flashes or other symptoms that might be experiencing um, can make a big difference. Um, there's, there's attention to employee resource groups where people can get together and talk about things that are helping them and gain support from each other. But also remembering that others, not just those experiencing it, need to be informed. So having educational seminars. If someone in um, who might be male is not experiencing hot flashes, I can guarantee you that they have a spouse, a sister, a mother, a coworker who is. And so they need to learn about it as well. 
um, and also just being aware of what are the practices and policies around um, time off or around um, other things that might be um, allowed for um, due to things specific to the female body. Um, and then just including these conversations as part of, of um, everyday manager man, uh, employee interactions, um, being allowing that it's okay to talk about the female body, that this isn't a source of stigma or shame, um, using inclusive language. So we haven't uh, modeled this very well, but we can talk about people going through menopause, um, certainly being more inclusive of our trans uh, 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 brothers and sisters. Um, and empathetic language around this is just a bodily experience. It can be extremely distressing for some people and no big thing for others. And so recognizing that whole um, process is, is part of life um, and it may not be distressing and it may not cause problems for the workplace. So not making assumptions about that, but being empathetic if it does. Um, and also recognizing that some people are less comfortable than others in talking about this. And so having opportunities for private conversations and being confidential and not forcing people to disclose um, if they're not comfortable doing so, um, but can do it in private. So in short, um, it's time to start talking about menopause at work. This uh, Harvard Business Review came out in 2020. I published some of uh, my findings in HBR in 2022. Um, Michelle Obama talked about this recently on a podcast. We need to talk about this. We're acting like it's not happening. We're pretending like it's not happening to try to fit in to the masculine environments and norms, but it is happening to half the workforce. And so we need to talk about it. And I'll conclude with this. Um, I love this book um, by Dr. Jen Hunter. Uh, it takes a feminist perspective on the idea of menopause. She says, there's no greater act of feminism than speaking up about a menopausal body in a patriarchal society. And I thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Grandy. This is, um, and thank you everyone for setting the stage for the panel discussion uh, for the remainder of this event. Um, I, again, I invite um, participants to submit their questions using the Q&A function within the app. We'll try to address as many individual questions and common themes as we can in the next uh, 10 or 15 minutes, but we recognize that we might not get to them all. And so now that we have you all in, let's dive in. Um, where do we start? As women are going through or navigating this transformational life change, right? They're, you know, um, there's, what do you think are some of their greatest concerns with raising their menopausal, you know, challenges they're having with menopause? I mean, that's pretty much a health concern, right? And so you're having these health challenges Whereas if there's some conditions they might be willing to disclose, but for menopause, there might be some stigma around that. Um, how can we change this conversation from being a liability-based piece of women going through menopause to being more of an asset or business acumen conversation? Well, remember when we couldn't say the C word? Do you remember that? Back in the days, for those of you who are old enough, we called it the C word, cancer. You didn't talk about cancer either. And so now, like you said, there are conditions that are able to talk about and menopause is just starting to be one of them, but there's a lot of education and effort that needs to go into making it a normal conversation um, because women will not bring it up because we have an ageist society. Um, and when you talk about menopause, it is identifying your age and we're not there yet as a, as a society. I would say that the the thing that's important is that women are not talking about it and not getting treated. And there are, there are treatments for almost every menopause symptom. And someone asked in one of the questions, we're saying estrogen is good for everybody. I would never say that. Nothing, everything works for somebody, nothing works for everybody. But there are treatments that are available for all of the symptoms, estrogen and otherwise. And the, the thing, important is that menopause and that transition is a time when a woman is transitioning and there's an opportunity to intervene to prevent or lower the chances of heart disease which kills 10 times more women than breast cancer 
and for osteoporosis because at 50 years of age, you're just as likely to die of a hip fracture or some problem from a bone fracture as you are from cancer. And the thing that's important is the more you intervene early, the less you have an impact on your uh, viability as you get older. So menopause should be that up, that, that invitation to check out your body, its changes, and slow those down at the soonest uh, possible uh, chance. And I'd add also, if I might, to, to your question, I mean, it, it's, menopause is not only medical symptoms. Menopause is also an a, a identity transition moment. And, and that is sometimes, um, I mean, the symptoms are real and I'm not trying to deny that they're not problematic and they can be, but for some women, they're not. And it's important to remember there is high extreme variability in the experience. But for many women, it is an identity shift. And I, I think about it as our bodies are moving away from reproductive capacity, but that means they're opening up opportunities for other forms of productive capacity. And that means you have a, a population that might be now kind of looking for what's my next new challenge? What's my next role now that I'm no longer um, worrying about these things? And if you think about it from that, that career span, you know, we, we think about the the stigma of menstruation and the stigma about pregnant and the maybe baby effect of, oh, she's not going to be very reliable as a coworker because she's going to go have a baby. All that's gone once you're menopausal. I'm not worrying anymore about menstruation or maternity or lactation. Doesn't that make me the ideal employee? <laughs> so, you know, we, we can, we can maybe, like you said, think more about the business acumen. There's some benefits to it as well. I also kind of give less of a, about what people think. So there, there's some things that maybe we can acknowledge are benefits from it as well. Well put. Absolutely. I like how you said, um, Dr. Seibel, this invitation, that menopause is an invitation to take stock. And it kind of goes with what you're saying, Dr. Grandy, like, you know, taking stock of what is my next challenge or, you know, pursuit, what is my body looking like, you know, how is, you know, what is my health rather, not my body, but what is my health looking like and how can I plan for these next couple decades? Because I think the idea that menopause is something that's end of life, we can, we can, completely move away from that, or we should move away from that. Um, it, that's saw, a, but it's yes. a great, I mean, those symptoms make us stop and pay attention to ourselves in ways where decades have sp probably been spent paying attention to others. And now our bodies are saying, no, pay attention to ourselves. What do we need in our own health? That's just one way of thinking about it that maybe puts a more positive spin on what can be very distressing symptoms. Time to nurture the nurturer. Hmm, yeah. yeah. And one of the things we talk about too is the fact that that women, we we play this role of incredible advocate for everyone else in our lives. And then when it comes to our own, you know, health, we don't. So one of the things we've been talking about and someone shared to me recently in a meeting meeting was if my child and that symptom repeated itself, I would be all over getting my child relief from that symptom and making sure that they never experienced that again. And then we took care of it. Right. But we never do that for ourselves. And so it is that perspective of, it, no, 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 it really is important that we pay attention to our own things. And it's okay to seek actual solutions to those symptoms that we're having, if that's what you need. And that, that, you know, combination of, it's not going to impact everyone the same way. I have women say to me, oh, I just breezed through menopause. So I'm like, great. And then I've had women who say to me, it was the most traumatic thing in my life. It was worse than childbirth for me. Okay. I understand. You know, it can be any of those things or all of those things, depending on the person. And there's a question I want to ask that came in talking about osteoporosis for Claire, the first part of it. Um, you mentioned a 20% decrease in bone density. Is that in perimenopause that it starts on average, or is it post-menopause? And then, well, the uh, go ahead. I was going to say just that the statistic that I referenced is postmenopausal in the first five to seven years after the sensation of your menstrual cycle. So when that dramatic drop in estrogen comes, that's when that dramatic drop happens. But it, it can begin earlier, again, depending on the woman and depending on her her risk factors. Um, and some of the risk factors for osteoporosis are controllable, and some are uncontrollable. So. Women experiencing menopause, uncontrollable. Um, family history, 
plays a big part in it. If someone in your family, your mother, father, aunt, uncle, anything, grandparents broke a bone, do you know, in, in their elder years, you know, and had osteoporosis, even if they weren't diagnosed with, with it, because 80% of people go undiagnosed, um, then your risk of osteoporosis is also increased. Um, but things we can control are calcium and vitamin D intake, making sure that we eat a healthy diet and that we're getting the nutrients most uh, most needed by our bones. Um, you should be able to get all of that from a well-balanced variety in our diet, but many people do need some supplementation, which you should talk to your provider about. And weight-bearing and muscle-strengthening exercises. So if we're talking about how do we prevent that increased loss earlier in our lives or when we're reaching menopause, um, it's weight-bearing exercise. And weight-bearing means on your feet. So if you're a swimmer or you like to ride a bike or you know do soul cycle, all great for your cardiovascular health, but you need to be on your feet and have some type of impact, walking, dancing, running, et cetera, hiking for it to be beneficial to your bone health. The person asked about what they could do to increase bone density and, and to prepare. And did you realize that menopause is not when you start losing bone? Your peak bone age as a woman is sometime around 21 or 22, somewhere in there. So the thing you could do is make sure your little girls are getting plenty of calcium and make sure that they're eating healthy and exercising and not sitting at a computer all day. And from the time of, you know, you're an adult throughout the rest of your life is try to be thinking favorably about the foods you eat, the nutrition, the supplements, if you're going to take them and so forth, starting well before menopause, because it's like, how long does it take when you jump out of a window to hit the ground? What well, depends on what floor you jump out of. So the how much bones you have to begin with is going to have a lot to do with your risk of osteoporosis as a person through going through menopause. So the more you have as a young adult, the more you have uh, that, uh, to spare. Yeah, but just keeping in mind, my bone density is going to be very different from yours, my body shape, right? And I started working at the National Osteoporosis Foundation, which is now the Bone Health and Osteoporosis Foundation. I was like, woohoo, one good thing for big bone girls, right? But there's so many other things that impact osteoporosis. And like I said, my mother having it means my increased risk is there. So Dr. Seibel is right. People don't know that osteoporosis, the, I'm sorry, that bone is living tissue that regenerates throughout our life. And so the earlier we start paying attention to our bone health, the more we put into our bone bank and build the strongest, densest bone we're going to have at peak bone mass, which as he said, is about mid twenties for men and women. Then you just continue to work that remodeling, healthy remodeling throughout your life. It does slow down a little bit, the process, you know, as we age, but it, it shouldn't stop. It continues. And so it's never too early and it's never too late to pay attention to your bone and to take steps to improve your bone density. Uh, Dr. Grandy, I just wanted to ask you a quick question um, at, regarding, you talked about some of the data and even as we've seen when it comes to symptoms or experiences um, that with Black and African-American and white women, what is what is the landscape looking like for Latino or Hispanic individuals or Asian individuals? Where is the research in that space? And if you can speak to some of that as well. Um, well, first of all, it did seem like there was a recording issue in the middle of my presentation. Um, so just for those who maybe missed what I was saying, um, so we we did run. So for, first of all, there is evidence that there are differences in terms of racial group experiences of symptoms. Um, and I, I, I probably focus mostly on vasomotor or hot flash symptoms. So I'll speak mostly to that. Um, but that, uh, black women tend to experience, uh, those symptoms more frequently and have more distress from those symptoms than white women that is thought potentially to be due to both environmental stressors, as well as to the lack of medical professionals responsiveness to their discomfort and pain. Um, so less likely to treat black women than white women. Um, Asian women tend to experience less on average than white women or black women. I believe Hispanic women fall somewhere in, in the middle between Asian. Uh, Claire, I see you nodding. Is that, does that sound right to your evidence as well? 
Um, and so these are these are with like huge studies uh, like the Midas and other other data sets like that that have hundreds and hundreds of people. They they can look at these um, on average differences. And of course, we keep in mind every group more variability within group than between group, right? So there's still tons of variability. Um, what I was speaking to was um, in our experiment. So we found the evidence that um, when we're looking at the reactions to having hot flashes. Uh, the reaction seemed to be more negative to white women in terms of uh, uh, the stat the stereotype of looking like they're not very strong or, or they lack agency and then penalizing them in terms of leadership roles. That seemed to occur more for white women, both in that um, real world sample as well as in our experimental design. Um, so it's pretty robust evidence. And that's probably due to the stereotypes of white women being more confirmed by seeing bodily weakness whereas black women tend to be stereotyped as more physically strong um, and more resilient. Again, that's that fits with medical community not treating them. So that's not always a good thing, um, but that does mean per perhaps they're shielded a bit from that stereotype being activated if they're seen having hot flashes. Does that make sense? Okay. May I make one quick comment to one of the questions? Someone was asking me about excessive menstrual bleeding and you know how common that is. It's very common in the transition of perimenopause. There are some things that are just hormonal and there are some things that are anatomical. And so it depends on if your uterus, your uterus is, has certain conditions that make you bleed more. And it may matter that your hormones are not balanced right. So either way, excessive bleeding should be treated. And I just encourage you to make sure you're not iron deficient because People who bleed, women who bleed a lot, lose iron, and then low iron makes you bleed more. And so that becomes a cycle. And so check with your doctor about your, your iron level, your blood count, and why you're having it, because there's treatments for all that. Well, I know we are coming to our close. That was great um, you know, advice. Before we wrap up, I do have one last question I want to ask each of you. We get women in general audiences, researchers, healthcare providers, industry and policymakers that tune into our events. And so what is one takeaway that you would recommend to one or maybe in broad to all of our viewer groups to help them better support women in the workplace throughout their menopause transition? And so we'll start with you, Mage, then Alicia, and then we'll have you, Claire, wrap this up. The question is, what can they do to better support women or what, what would you? What hill would you like to fall on to say, this is what, <laughs> this is your recommendation to either, it could be healthcare providers, it can be women, it could be employers, it could be policymakers or all I of would say The most important thing is to recognize that menopause is a normal transition. It does come with symptoms, but there are treatments for all of these symptoms and that you shouldn't suffer in silence. If you go to a provider that cannot help you, I would highly recommend that you get to someone who can, that, because there are people trained. Unfortunately, a minority of doctors are trained in menopause, only about 30%. So it's important to get to someone who can help you and realize that there is help available and then open the topic and be willing to talk about it because if you can talk about it, you can do something about it. I'll, I'll build on that and say those symptoms that have treatments are not the direct cause of why there are work costs, that it's the stigma around the symptoms that contribute to women leaving the workplace or not getting leadership roles or opting out and retiring early. And so by addressing the stigma, by talking about it, by disclosing if one feels their job is secure and they're comfortable doing so, and by the way, disclosing, even if you're not having symptoms, because that communicates the diversity of the menopausal experience. It's not just people having extreme symptoms. I try to mention I'm menopausal, I'm postmenopausal now, but I try to mention it often, particularly when I'm doing just fine, because I'm associating being menopausal with performing adequately or well. So disclosing it, if you feel comfortable to reduce the stigma, which then will hopefully make addressing the symptoms even more possible and likely. And my my message is sort of like in between both of those in that um, that as women we need to know that um, there is no prize for suffering. Um, I don't know why we seem to think there is, but there really that's it. There's no prize for suffering. So 
If you need to speak out, whether that be to your provider at the workplace, please do so. And then have grace for yourself and your friends and the other women. You know, as Alicia said, not everyone experiences what you experienced. And we have to have grace for those around us to say, that may not be my experience and I might have breezed through it, but I'm gonna still speak up in the workforce, as you said, or I'm still going to acknowledge, you know, amongst my peer group, that this is something that um, is, is acceptable to talk about, whether or not we are experiencing those symptoms or not. Thank you so much. That is, um, this is all great advice. We thank you so much for your transparency, your time and your insight. And we'd also like to thank Stellis Pharma, Bayer, Nutrafol and Pfizer for their support of this event and SWHR's menopause program. Again, we could not do this work without the expertise and contributions of our interdisciplinary networks, particularly the Menopause Workplace Education Working Group, which our panelists are also uh, members of. And they've all contributed to their expertise to the impact menopause study and the development of SWHR's menopause workplace resource guides. It is our sincere hope that this set of resource, these set of resources can help individuals across the career spectrums, leadership, and industries to address these significant gaps for midlife and older women and ultimately help improve wellness for all individuals at work. You can download this and other resources from our website, www.swhr.org. Um, SWHR also has a menopause preparedness toolkit that goes more in depth about understanding menopause and its impacts on women's health, as well as tips to prepare women for conversations with their healthcare providers, families, and friends throughout their menopause journey. We will send an email with the recording of today's webinar to all registrants, as well as post recording on, uh, as well as post the recording um, of this event on the event webpage for future viewing. So please be on the lookout for that and feel free to share any and all of these resources with others. And make sure to sign up for our newsletter so you can stay connected with us on social media as we continue the important conversation with hashtag SWHR Talks Menopause. Thank you for joining us today.